Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Morell, and I work in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of the One Health Office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly zoonoses and One Health Updates call on April 7th, 2021. Next slide, please. Although the content of this webinar is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals in federal, state, and local positions, CDC has no control over who participates. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality cannot be guaranteed. Today's webinar is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect now. Next slide. Today's presentations will address one or more of the following five objectives. Describe two key points from each presentation. Describe how a multi-sectoral One Health approach can be applied to the presentation topics. Identify an implication for animal and human health. Identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention, detection, or response to public health threats. And identify two new resources from CDC partners. Next slide. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses and partners wish to disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. The presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. Next slide. Instructions for receiving free continuing education are available at cdc.gov slash one health slash Zohu slash continuing education. The course access code is one health 2021. To receive free CE for today's webcast, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by May 10th, 2021. A captioned video of today's webinar will be posted at cdc.gov slash one health slash Zohu slash 2021 slash april.html within 30 days. To receive free CE for the web on demand video of today's webinar, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by May 11th, 2023. Next slide, please. Before we begin today's presentations, Dr. Colin Basler, Deputy Director of CDC's One Health Office will share some news and updates. Please begin when you're ready. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's Zohu Call. We appreciate your help in spreading the word about the Zohu Call by sharing the website link with your colleagues from human, animal, plant, environment, and other relevant health sectors. Before our presentations, I'd like to share a few One Health COVID-19 updates and some highlights from today's Zohu Call email newsletter. If you're not yet subscribed, please use the link at the top of the main Zohu Call webpage so you can stay informed. CDC's response to COVID-19 outbreak continues to evolve. Please check CDC's website for the latest guidance and resources, including information about keeping people as well as pets and other animals safe and healthy. We also hold a monthly One Health Partners COVID-19 webinar to provide news, key updates, guidance, and resources for public health officials, animal health officials, veterinarians, and pet owners. The next call will be on April 20th. Please email onehealth at cdc.gov to receive more information on how to join the webinar. Next slide, please. At this time, CDC is aware of 255 confirmed cases of SARS-CoV-2 infection in animals from 25 countries, including cases in pet dogs and cats, large cats, including tigers and lions, gorillas, a pet ferret, and a wild mink caught around a U.S. mink farm that was confirmed with SARS-CoV-2. This does not include the number of individual farmed mink that are confirmed with SARS-CoV-2. We are also aware of 422 mink farms with SARS-CoV-2 in 11 countries. 16 mink farms in four U.S. states have had mink confirmed as positive for SARS-CoV-2. The latest animal case numbers and guidance for farmers and veterinarians are available on the USDA APHIS website. 
AFIS also reports positive animals in the United States to the World Organization for Animal Health, or OIE. At this time, there is no evidence that animals play a significant role in, in spreading SARS-CoV-2 to people. Based on the limited information available to date, the risk of animals spreading COVID-19 to people is considered to be low. More studies are needed to understand if and how different animals could be affected by COVID-19. We will continue to keep sharing timely updates as the knowledge around COVID-19 and animals evolves. Next slide. Some recent publications of interest include a One Health Approach to Child Stunting uh, and a, a Giardiasis Outbreaks in the U.S. from 2012 to 2017. Next slide, please. Some new web uh, resources of interest include the uh, fact that the OIE has launched an update to the World Animal Health Information System uh, to support country, and the system is utilized to support countries in maintaining global transparency and reporting matters of animal and public health. In addition, CDC's new Waterborne Disease Outbreak Investigation Toolkit was developed to assist uh, state, local, territorial, and tribal health departments with investigating waterborne disease outbreaks. And as you can see, there are a couple of additional uh, new web resources available on this list as well. Next slide, please. Uh, here are some upcoming events of interest and just wanted to highlight a couple here, including the National Public Health Week, which is this week from April 5th to April 7th. And World uh, Veterinary Day is on April 24th. Next slide. And finally, uh, to review a couple of recent outbreak investigations of interest, there is a new salmonella outbreak linked to wild songbirds, and CDC recommends cleaning and disinfecting bird feeders and bird baths weekly. Please visit CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website for a selected list of ongoing and past U.S. outbreaks of zoonotic diseases. Our next call will take place on May 5th. Uh, please email topic suggestions for future presentations and news from your organization to zohucall at cdc.gov. And now I'd like to turn the call back over to Laura. Thank you. Next slide, please. You can submit questions at any time using Zoom's Q&A feature. Please include the topic or presenter's name with your question. The Q&A session will follow the final presentation if time permits. You can also email questions to today's presenters. We've included their email addresses on this slide, on the Zoku Call webpage for today's webinar, and in today's email newsletter. Next slide, please. Our first presentation, Investigation of Severe Outcomes of SARS-CoV-2 Infection in Companion Animals, is by Dr. Ann Carpenter. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you, Laura, and good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to discuss with you today an investigation of severe outcomes of SARS-CoV-2 infection in companion animals. Today, we'll walk through a case series of 10 companion animals confirmed positive for SARS-CoV-2 infection. Next slide, please. To begin, I'd like to define what we mean by severe outcomes in companion animals. Companion animals in this presentation refers to dogs and cats, Severe outcomes refers to cases where animals with SARS-CoV-2 died or were euthanized. Next slide, please. To date, 124 companion animals, 75 cats, and 49 dogs have been confirmed to be infected with SARS-CoV-2 in the U.S. Of these cases, 52 animals, or about 41%, do not show any signs of illness, while 56 animals, or 44%, show clinical signs. We don't have data on signs of disease for 19 animals, or about 15%. In animals that do show signs of illness, most are respiratory, shown in blue on the graph on the bottom, which include coughing, sneezing, shortness of breath, and nasal or ocular discharge. Fewer animals show nonspecific signs, like lethargy and inappetence, and even fewer animals show gastrointestinal signs, like vomiting and diarrhea. Those animals are represented in orange on the graph. Next slide, please. This case series will focus on a specific time frame from March 2020 to January 2021. 
During that time, 94 companion animals tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 in the U.S. Of these confirmed cases, 10 animals, or 11%, died or were euthanized. The purpose of this presentation is to walk through the algorithm that was developed to investigate what role, if any, SARS-CoV-2 played in the animal's clinical signs, course of disease, and death or euthanasia. Next slide, please. Of these 10 animals with severe outcomes, five were dogs and five were cats. The mean age was approximately eight years and ranged from three to 16 years. Nine animals were male and one was female. They were located in 10 different states and all lived in households with human COVID-19 cases. Next slide, please. I know that many of you are familiar with the concept of One Health, but the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted that this concept of a multidisciplinary effort to coordinate and collaborate across sectors to work to protect human, animal, and environmental health is critical to achieve the best health outcomes possible for people, animals, plants, and our shared environment. Many partners were involved in the One Health investigations of these cases. Next slide, please. This slide describes the investigation process of animals presumed or confirmed to be infected with SARS-CoV-2. As you can see, many different partners are involved, from veterinarians treating the animals to state and local animal and public health officials, laboratories performing presumptive and confirmatory testing, and federal partners. All confirmed cases of SARS-CoV-2 in animals are reported to the World Organization for Animal Health, or OIE. Next slide, please. To help support our state and local partners in their investigations of presumptive and confirmed animals, the CDC One Health Working Group has created and shared a toolkit to help prepare for and manage animal cases. In addition, we created a standardized data collection tool, the Case Investigation Form, to help direct and supplement epidemiological investigations. These forms collect information on signalment, history, epidemiologic data, and testing information, including sample collection, timeline, and any confirmatory results. Next slide, please. Because SARS-CoV-2 is a new emerging disease and the spectrum of disease is not well characterized in companion animals with natural infection, we realized that it was of the utmost importance to learn as much as possible from each of these animal cases, particularly those with severe outcomes. All 10 severe outcomes cases had comorbid conditions and federal partners collaborated to create a SARS-CoV-2 supplemental necropsy sample inventory checklist to help guide necropsies, shown here. In cases where either a necropsy was performed and or postmortem tissue samples were collected, CDC's Infectious Diseases Pathology Branch received tissue samples to conduct further testing. This included histologic evaluation, and special staining for the virus and other pathogens. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. To help evaluate the role of SARS-CoV-2 in the course of illness, the CDC One Health Working Group created an algorithm shown here. This flowchart uses information on clinical signs, comorbidities or concurrent disease, the presence of virus in critical organs, the brain, heart, and lungs, and histologic evaluation of tissues to determine if SARS-CoV-2 infection was an, inc an incidental finding, contributing factor, or the primary reason for the animal's death or euthanasia. Over the next few slides, I'll walk through the steps of this algorithm with the 10 cases with severe outcomes. Next slide, please. Our first step in the algorithm was to evaluate if clinical signs that were appreciated were consistent with SARS-CoV-2 infection. From our other case investigations shown previously, we know that the most common clinical signs in animals infected with SARS-CoV-2 are respiratory and gastrointestinal. These are also described in the CDC evaluation for SARS-CoV-2 testing in animals. We found that the 10 animals with severe outcomes had variable clinical signs and not all of them fit into our guidance for testing. Three animals had neurologic signs, two had nonspecific signs like lethargy and inappetence, one animal was vocalizing and posturing to urinate, and seven animals showed respiratory signs. 
As you can see, these numbers do not add up to 10 because several of the animals had multiple types of clinical finds. Next slide, please. Our next step was to evaluate for any comorbidities and to determine if there were other disease processes present that caused the clinical signs or severe disease. The case investigations, which we described earlier, collected information on antemortem di diagnostics and postmortem evaluation, like necropsies. From these investigations, we learned that all 10 cases had comorbidities, and most of these were severe. These comorbid conditions included hemic and pituitary neoplasia or cancer, bacterial pneumonia, meningitis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a type of heart disease, suspect disc disease or spinal neoplasia, and urinary obstruction. Next slide, please. In cases where a necropsy was completed or tissue was otherwise collected, we collaborated with pathologists at state laboratories and CDC's Infectious Diseases Pathology Branch to evaluate if SARS-CoV-2 was present in the brain, heart, or lungs. If possible, virus isolation was attempted to determine if the virus was alive or dead. In four cases, virus was identified in tissues. Next slide, please. Our final step in the algorithm was to evaluate if there were histopathologic changes in the tissue that were attributable to the virus. This allowed us to distinguish between viremia and true tissue infection. Through collaboration with pathologists, we learned that these changes were present in three cases. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about how we interpreted this data. Next slide, please. In eight of 10 cases, we determined that SARS-CoV-2 was an incidental finding. Many of these animals had clinical signs that were not consistent with SARS-CoV-2 infection and or had severe comorbidities that were responsible for their illness. Examples of these severe comorbidities included urinary obstruction, different types of cancer, bacterial pneumonia, and other conditions. In one case, a dog with chronic, severe underlying respiratory disease SARS-CoV-2 was determined to be a contributing factor. In one cat, SARS-CoV-2 infection was concluded to be the primary reason for euthanasia. Next slide, please. Next, I'll go through our algorithm for these two cases where SARS-CoV-2 infection was not an incidental finding. The first case was an eight-year-old male neuter dog with a history of chronic respiratory signs. Postmortem diagnostics and necropsy showed that severe chronic lung disease a severe comorbidity in the algorithm was present. Lung tissue was PCR positive for SARS-CoV-2, and histopathologic changes in the lung tissue were present. SARS-CoV-2 was determined to be a contributing factor. The final case was a four-year-old male neutered cat with respiratory signs. This cat had previously been diagnosed with a heart murmur, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was identified on necropsy. Virus was identified in critical tissues, and histopathologic changes were present that were attributable to SARS-CoV-2 infection, and it was determined to be the primary reason for this animal's euthanasia. Next slide, please. From these investigations, we learned that severe disease in animals as a result of SARS-CoV-2 infection is rare. In only two animals out of 94 confirmed cases did the virus contribute to a severe outcome. Further research is needed to understand how SARS-CoV-2 presents in animals with natural infection, particularly those with underlying disease. All of these cases were infected by people with COVID-19, and this information further supports CDC recommendations to treat pets like you would other people when you are infected with SARS-CoV-2 and to avoid contact with pets while you are sick. These cases also highlight the need for One Health collaboration and complete investigations of animal cases. Next slide, please. We faced a number of challenges when investigating these cases. Because SARS-CoV-2 is a novel emerging infectious disease, very limited data was available on companion animal susceptibility, and the spectrum of disease in animals was not well-defined. Additionally, there's no standardized reporting or notification system for animals with SARS-CoV-2. Unlike diseases with a standardized process list, like CSTE and USDA listed diseases, there is not a clear process to define how animals were tested, investigated, and reported. Case investigation information was submitted by state partners voluntarily. In some cases, complete diagnostic workups to rule out other diseases were not always possible, 
and diagnostics or treatments were sometimes declined. Similarly, necropsies were not always possible, and in some cases they were declined, or the body was no longer available when confirmatory test results were obtained. Next slide, please. As I conclude this presentation, I wanted to provide a reminder that CDC has general information on COVID-19 in animals and information for pet owners, including those who test positive or care for animals that test positive, linked from this one landing page shown here. Next slide, please. Additionally, there are many other resources available with information on COVID-19 in animals. Next slide, please. I wanted to thank all of the state and local officials, veterinarians, pathologists, and owners who provided information to make these investigations possible, as well as my mentors and colleagues, Drs. Ryan Wallace, Casey barton Barabesh, and Rhea Guy. Thank you, and back over to you, Laura. Thank you, Dr. Carpenter. Next slide, please. Our next presentation, Novel Rickettsia Species Infecting Dogs, United States, is by James M. Wilson. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you, Laura. Um, today I'm going to be discussing a, a novel Rickettsia species that we found at North Carolina State University um, that's been infecting dogs in the United States. Next slide, please. So first I'm going to go over some general spotted fever group Rickettsia information. Um, Rickettsia are vector transmitted um, obligate intracellular gram negative bacteria. There are approximately 25 species of spotted fever group rickettsia in the world. Um, they're trans uh, transmitted by a variety of ticks. Um, several species of the spotted fever group are linked to disease in people, um, but they appear to be minimally or non-pathogenic in dogs, except for rickettsia rickettsii. Um, rickettsia rickettsii is a Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, is otherwise known as. Um, it's one of the most important spotted fever group rickettsia because it does cause serious illness in dogs um, and in pe people as well. Um, at the bottom of the screen here, we can kind of see a um, transmission from the tick uh, with the rickettsia to the dog. Um, and then there is a petechia, um, small dots on the gums of the dog we typically see in Rocky Mountain spotted fever cases. So next slide, please. Uh, next slide, thank you. The novel rickettsia um, in dogs. So everything I'm going to go over here: uh, detection, the phylogenetic analysis, the cases that were outlined, um, and the EID dispatch published um, in infectious disease. Um, some new cases we've had since that dispatch, um, and then some further ongoing research um, that we're going to be using. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, I'm not seeing the next transition. Um, I'll pull up another one. Um, so here we have the transmission and detection of the spotted fever group rickettsia. Um, off, starting from the top left, you can see the rickettsia species uh, is infecting uh, canine endothelial cells. Um, there's small amounts that are shed into the blood, um, and that's where we can detect with a qPCR assay. Um, clinicians will send us blood samples um, from infected dogs to our lab. We'll extract the DNA. Uh, we'll Target and then we'll also sequence that target and we use the 23S5S base region for that. Next slide, please. Um, so here we can see a, a phylogenetic analysis that uh, we made for this um, novel rickettsia. Uh, first, we started with the screening target, the 23S5S. Um, we found that it was 95% identical with the fever group rickettsia. Uh, typically, we would uh, expect to see 100% match um, for this particular gene. Um, so once we figured out that there wasn't an exact match for this body group rickettsia, um, we then targeted four other um, gene targets and we concatenated that into a um, concatenation and we created a phylogenetic tree using the maximum likelihood and Tamara name model. Um, and on the right side, you can see the phylogenetic tree. Um, the rickettsia, the novel rickettsia species is uh, centered right in the middle of all these other spotted fever group rickettsia surrounding it. Um, you can see that there is a common ancestor um, between that novel rickettsia and the rickettsia below. Uh, next slide, please. So there are a few clinical findings in the cases that were outlined in the uh, EID dispatch. Um, these first three cases all had the uh, fever and lower platelets. 
Um, these are typically seen in um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever cases. Um, so it's uh, notable just because right now the only other um, spotted fever group or that we know that causes disease in canines or dogs, <clears throat> excuse me, um, are also are just from Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, so this novel rickettsia could possibly be causing um, these clinical signs. Next slide. Oh, as far as the uh, rickettsia diagnostic testing, um, all three cases tested positive for the novel rickettsia with PCR testing. Um, all three also had a um, they all tested positive in the acute um, and two in the convalescent. Um, Rocky Mountain fever uh, is the IFA for that's typically um, does not react with other spotted fever rickettsia and uh, the IFA um, for the rickettsia rickettsia. Next slide, please. As far as treatment and outcomes, um, for all three cases, uh, they were treated with doxycycline. Um, the first two cases, the abnormalities dissolved the dogs, but unfortunately, on the third case, um, the patient was euthanized. There was also um, concurrent diagnosis of uh, IMHA and PLN for that. Uh, next slide. So for the timeline and uh, the 2020 cases, um, there were seven cases total. Um, the first three cases were outlined in emerging infectious disease. Um, they're listed there. All of the cases, um, again, we have a travel history for three cases, all the cases uh, states are laid out there. I'll be talking more about that on the next slide. Um, all seven of these cases uh, had the presence of ticks on the dogs, except for case number six. Um, all seven cases were PCR positive as well as IFA positive. All seven cases um, had a fever, um, except for number, uh, and all seven had uh, lower platelets, except for number four. Um, there were not lower platelets in that dog. Um, there are also a few other co-infections that occurred uh, for these dogs, um, and they're listed there as well. As far as the timeline goes, uh, we've had seven cases total, one case in 2018, two cases in 2019, um, this is not using our same asset from 2014. All right, James, I think your connection has cut out a bit. We're having trouble so hearing you. Um, we just started seeing it in 2018. We've been getting more cases every year since then. We have no cases here, but we haven't hit that thing somewhere. Oh, would you like to start from the top of the slide? Can you, uh, can you hear me now? Hi. Yes, I hear you a little bit better now. Okay, would you like me to start from the top of that slide? Yeah, that might be a good idea. Okay, so we had seven cases uh, total. Um, all seven of the cases uh, tested uh, positive for PCR and IFA. All seven of the dogs, except for case number six, had the presence of ticks. Um, as far as the state goes, I'll be discussing that more in the next slide. Um, there were three cases of travel history uh, with three of these animals. Um, as far as the clinical commonalities, all seven of the cases had a fever, um, but case number four did not have lower platelets, um, but there were lower platelets in the rest of the cases. There was also um, three uh, signs of co-infection for three of the animals um, listed here. Um, as far as the timeline goes, we have had seven total cases. Um, the first case in 2018, um, the second two cases in 2019, and four cases in 2020. Um, this is significant because uh, we've been testing the same assay since 2014. Uh, we've just now started detecting um, this rickettsia in 2018. Um, so it is likely that this is an uh, emerging disease um, because we should have been detecting this since 2014. Uh, next slide, please. So as far as the geographic location of the cases, um, we had three animals with a travel history, uh, one from um, Colorado to uh, both Minnesota and Wisconsin, one from Texas to Oklahoma, and one from Illinois to Arkansas. Uh, we also had a case in Tennessee, and North so far has come from Oklahoma. We have three from there. Um, so we've been working with some researchers from Oklahoma. I'll discuss that more in few, uh, further in another slide. Um, next slide, please. 
So as far as ongoing research, uh, we are trying to culture and isolate this rickettsia currently. Um, we're isolating it directly from uh, dog blood submitted to the VBDDL. Uh, we've had seven cases so far. Uh, we have yet been able to isolate um, the novel rickettsia. Um, this just speaks to how difficult it can be to isolate um, this kind of intracellular bacteria from a sample that's been uh, drawn from a, a dog, sent to us, and then tested. It's been sitting in the fridge, um, so it can be difficult to isolate after it's been, the sample's been sitting for so long. Um, we are hopeful uh, this year we'll be able to isolate. Uh, we have a few cell lines we're using, um, human endothelial cells, Amblyona americanum line, as well as uh, Exodi scapularis. Uh, we'll also be using Vero cells. Uh, as far as identifying the vector, um, we are getting Amblyoma americanum ticks from Oklahoma State University. Um, we're hoping to identify a vector um, by extracting DNA from these ticks and sequencing, um, looking for specifically our novel rickettsia, um, just in hopes to find a vector. Next slide, please. Uh, so for my last slide, I just wanted to outline some um, general tick prevention. Um, it's always a good idea to uh, keep your pets uh, access away from brush and tall grasses uh, around your house and in your yard. Um, there's plenty of uh, tick preventatives for animals um, uh, that you can talk to your vet about and then also try to avoid a uh, um, thick brush when you're walking outside, um, traveling anywhere, try to wear long pants. Um, there are plenty of good resources on the CDC website for tick prevention. Next slide, please. Also uh, wanted to just say thanks uh, for all the co-authors and collaborators and the supporting clinics that helped with this uh, dispatch. Uh, we have uh, help from Oklahoma State University, University of Minnesota, as well as the Vector-Borne Disease Diagnostic Lab um, pictured here. Uh, it takes a, a small army to run a research and diagnostic lab. So just wanna say thanks and thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please. Our final presentation, Salmonellosis Outbreaks Linked to Backyard Poultry, United States 2020, is by Dr. Megan Nichols, Lauren Galarza, and Alexandra Palacios. Please begin when you're ready. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Megan Nichols, and I lead a team at CDC that investigates multi-state outbreaks of enteric illness that's linked to animal contact. Today, our team is presenting some of the findings from the 2020 Salmonellosis Outbreaks Linked to Contact with Backyard Poultry. Next slide. 2020 was a unique year in epidemiology for many reasons. And many of you on today's webinar might have seen headlines such as the one presented on this page. The team at CDC also noticed an increase in interest from parents in taking on backyard poultry rearing while children were home from school. We believe that this is one of the factors that may have spurred an increase in sales of backyard poultry beyond what we've seen in previous years. Next slide. Another factor related to increased interest in backyard poultry ownership may have been related to increased interest in food production by consumers who were concerned about potential de decreases in food availability in stores, such as eggs or meat. And this is an example of an article that appeared in a couple of periodicals regarding this topic. Next slide. On this graph, you'll see the number of clinical or non-human origin, or excuse me, human origin salmonella isolates uploaded weekly to PulseNet that were linked to backyard poultry outbreaks in 2020, relative to the three-year average of isolates uploaded during 2017 and 2019, uh, linked to backyard poultry. The number of isolates uploaded in 2020 surpassed this three-year average. This was despite a 20% decline in the overall number of clinical isolates with whole genome sequencing uploaded to PulseNet, the National Molecular Subtyping Network for Foodborne Disease Surveillance. This indicated to us that the number of illnesses reported in 2020 linked to backyard poultry um, has been an underestimate and even an underestimate beyond what we would expect for salmonella. Next slide. Yet despite this, the number of outbreaks and the number of outbreak associated illnesses linked to backyard poultry in 2020 was significantly greater than any previously, previous year reported. I'll now turn it over to my colleague to provide some additional information regarding the 2020 outbreaks specifically. Next slide. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Lexi Palacios, and I'm an epidemiologist in the outbreak response and prevention branch that worked on the 2020 live poultry outbreaks with Dr. Nichols. I want to go through the specifics of the 2020 outbreaks and discuss how this year was unique compared to previous years. The Salmonella backyard poultry outbreaks consisted of 1,722 illnesses in all 50 states. The investigation consisted of 17 different outbreaks and 12 Salmonella serotypes, a few of which are commonly seen in live poultry outbreaks like Agona, Anatum, Branderup, Enteritidis, Hadar, I-45, Infantis, and Typhumerium. We also saw a few serotypes that are less commonly seen in live poultry outbreaks, like Mbendaka, Munchen, Newport, and Thompson. Serotypes Enteritidis, Infantis, and Typhumerium all had multiple whole genome sequencing groups, which is how we get to 17 total outbreaks. Of the 879 ill people with exposure information, 578 or 66% reported contact with live poultry prior to illness onset. Next slide, please. This map shows illnesses across all 50 states. The majority of cases came from the Midwest and East Coast region, with particularly high case counts in California, New York, and Kentucky. Next slide, please. This slide shows the epi curve of the outbreak uh, with the number of illnesses by date of illness onset. The peak of illnesses is seen in April and May, where we would usually see 50 to 60 new cases per week. This also coincides with the start of live poultry season when people would normally go out and purchase their poultry. This epi curve has a long tail that goes into November. This long tail is likely explained through continued sales through the fall and promotional events that are held by feed stores. Additionally, the long tail and volume of cases could also be explained by new poultry owners during quarantine. In previous years, the live poultry outbreaks would be closed in September or October. However, the 2020 outbreaks uh, we're unique in that we continued to see about 20 to 30 new illnesses per week throughout the month of November. These, uh, the outbreak was officially closed on December 7, 2020. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to talk about uh, different demographics and outcomes from the 2020 outbreaks. Ages ranged from less than one to 95 years with a median of 35 years. Breaking age down into categories, 36% of illnesses were in children under 18 years and 23% of illnesses were in adults and seniors over 60. 59% of patients were female and 332 or 33% of patients were hospitalized and there was one reported death in Oklahoma. Next slide, please. We were able to collect supplemental data with our live poultry questionnaire. Cases were interviewed by state and local health departments on details about their live poultry exposure and ownership. We also collected data on where the poultry was purchased so that we could conduct traceback. This year, we saw a decrease in the number of completed live poultry questionnaires, likely due to the limited resources in state and local health officials because of the COVID-19 pandemic. In previous years, we were able to collect around four to 500 supplemental questionnaires, and this year we were only able to collect 266. Of those uh, supplemental questionnaires, we had 66% of people reporting purchasing live poultry in 2020. We also had 10 people report potential occupational exposure who reported contact with live poultry at their place of employment, such as at a feed store or a pet store. 68% of cases reported only owning live poultry for less than six months, while 74% reported owning live poultry for less than one year. And as I said before, we did suspect a lot of first-time poultry owners purchase, uh, purchasing poultry to keep busy during quarantine. And we did have two people anecdotally tell us that quarantine was the reason that they purchased live poultry to entertain themselves and, or their children. Next slide, please. Species of poultry reported by cases mostly consists of chickens, ducks, and turkeys. 115 people or 43% reported exposures from chicks or chickens only, while 18% reported exposure to both chickens and ducks. Other species of poultry included guineas, pigeons, and geese. 50% uh, of people reported only purchasing baby poultry, while only 10% reported purchasing adult uh, poultry. And interestingly, 65 people or 26% reported keeping their poultry indoors or inside their um, so in conclusion, outbreaks linked to backyard poultry are expected by the enteric zoonoses team every year. However, the 2020 outbreaks of salmonella linked to backyard poultry was the largest outbreak ever reported. 
Additionally, these illnesses spanned over 12 months and spread across all 50 states. Although these outbreaks were the largest that we've seen, the COVID-19 pandemic created limited resources for federal, state, and local partners, leaving the data and questionnaires less accessible to us. With these final thoughts, I'll turn it over to Lauren Galarza to discuss why these outbreaks are getting larger and what is being done to prevent illnesses in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Lexi. Hi, I'm Lauren Galarza, and I work in the Outbreak Response and Prevention Branch with Megan and Lexi. Next slide, please. One of the things that we've been asking ourselves is, you know, why are these outbreaks getting larger? And one potential hypothesis there, as you heard uh, Megan and Lexi mention earlier, is that we've seen such an increased um, interest in owning backyard poultry, and we've heard that there's been an increase in demand from the backyard poultry industry itself as well, especially this past year. Next slide. One other thing we know, um, both from our backyard poultry outbreak data that we've collected in previous years and from looking at, at different sources such as social media, some of the images that you see here, is that people sometimes tend to engage in what we would consider riskier behaviors um, in terms of salmonella transmission. So these birds can carry salmonella while looking healthy and clean. Um, and so bringing them into you know, homes and into kitchen sinks, uh, areas where you work, or having them climb you know, on uh, children's toys could potentially be contaminating um, those surfaces. So even though someone may recognize that they need to wash their hands after touching the bird themselves, they may forget about some of those other surfaces that could have become contaminated. Next slide. So one thing that we, we try to do um, during all of these outbreak investigations is really use a One Health approach to our collaboration. And you can see some of the folks that we collaborate with on this slide. And it really takes all of us working together to, to try to reduce human illness. So we work with the hatcheries who raise these animals to try to reduce the amount of salmonella that's in those birds. Um, and also work with them and others to get our educational materials out. Next slide. So all of our education materials can be found um, on our website, on the Healthy Pets, Healthy People website, but you can also go to cdc.gov slash backyard poultry. And I did want to highlight two of them here. So on the left, we have a graphic that's a reminder to wash your hands after handling live poultry. And it can actually be printed as a sticker and put on um, backyard poultry shipping boxes or even on the uh, chick boxes that people can uh, bring home when they purchase backyard poultry. And then on the right, we have a newer graphic that highlights um, this increase in illnesses and outbreaks over time, as well as a few uh, quick prevention tips. Next slide. So one other thing that, that we're excited and, and hope we'll get some final approvals and get to start is that we're actually looking at doing some focus groups with backyard poultry owners. So this will help us identify their uh, knowledge and beliefs around backyard poultry ownership and infection prevention prevention and also get to test some of our existing communication materials and get feedback on what people like about them and don't like or what might be confusing that we need to clarify and hopefully find um, routes of dissemination that actually get to people who are uh, looking to purchase backyard poultry. So with that, I'll turn it back to Megan. Well, next slide. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present today, and we look forward to the discussion or answering any questions with the speakers. Our contact information for our group is listed here on the slide. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, and thanks to all of today's speakers for your informative presentations. Next slide, please. So we have time for a few questions. Please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to send your questions, and please include the presenter's name or topic. Um, we do have a question for our poultry presenters. Uh, were any of the occupational exposures associated with mail carriers or were there any nursing home exposures? Yeah, hi, this is Lexi Palacios. Um, so for um, occupational exposures, we don't ask specifically um, where it happened usually when the local or state health department interviews um, and they mention uh, live poultry or they're interviewed with the live poultry questionnaire. 
usually the person will say, oh, well, I work at this feed store, or I work at this pet store. And so the interviewer will make a note about it um, in the interview and then send it back to us. So that's how we found out about the occupational exposures from the feed stores. I don't recall seeing any specifically from mail carriers, but um, Dr. Nichols, if you want to jump in, maybe she has other thoughts on that. Yeah, that's certainly something we've seen in the past, but Lexi is correct. This year, the uh, predominant um, report for those who did note occupational exposures was among feed store employees. And we do work with our state partners to get that information um, back to the feed stores so that they can implement um, infection prevention more rigorously within some of those stores. Thank you both. Um, we do have a question for James and the Rickettsia presentation. Were there any wild canine detections? Um, there were no uh, wild canine detections. These were all from dogs that were submitted to our clinical laboratory um, at the Vector Borne Disease Diagnostic Lab um, from clinicians uh, just across country who submit samples to us for tick testing. Um, so these were all domesticated, um, just domestic dogs. Yeah. Thank you. And we have a few questions for Dr. Carpenter. Um, how did you find the 51 positive animals without signs? Sure, Laura. Some of the animals were identified as part of active surveillance efforts, testing animals from homes with COVID-19 cases or animals that were otherwise exposed to other human COVID-19 cases. So many of the asymptomatic animals were identified this way. And because we do see that there are so many animals without clinical signs, it's likely that the total number of confirmed cases um, is under, under identified. Thank you. Thank you. And there's one other question. Is COVID a reportable uh, illness for all veterinary cases? Infection with SARS-CoV-2 in any animal species meets the World Organization for Animal Health or OIE definition of an emerging disease. Um, therefore, the OIE expects member countries, including the U.S., to report confirmed positive infections with SARS-CoV-2 in any species. However, it is not notifiable to CDC or USDA. Thank you. And there is a um, question for Lexi. Uh, can you share anything about the wording of the questions about cases keeping poultry indoors? Was that during the chick stage only or also adult poultry? Yeah. Hi, so I actually pulled up the questionnaire so I could give you the exact wording. Um, it does say, where are the poultry kept? Check all that apply, and then the options are indoors, outdoors, and then other. So usually we just get the basic indoor versus outdoor. And then in the comments of the live poultry questionnaire, um, the interviewer will usually um, give details like uh, poultry was kept inside in the, in the patient's bathroom or Poultry was kept inside, but in an outdoor chicken coop sort of thing. Um, but usually we don't get information on what stage the poultry is kept inside or how long the poultry is kept inside. We just get that basic question. And then sometimes there's additional information in the comments. Thank you. And another one on the Rickettsia presentation. Um, can you please provide more information about the Rickettsia species, um, and also what species of ticks were identified on the infected dogs, if you could share that. Um, so the, the ticks, uh, we actually don't have a species for those ticks. Uh, they were mostly um, just a retrospective study. So the clinicians took notes, um, noted that the, either the owners or the clinician, they found ticks on the dogs. Um, they didn't specify the ticks or save any for us. Um, so fortunately, we don't have a, a species for those. Thank you. Um, and back to Dr. Carpenter, did any of the eight pets uh, that SARS-CoV-2 was determined to be incidental in have virus detected in tissues? Yes, they did. There was virus identified in the upper respiratory tract of at least one animal, um, but this was um, did not contribute to the severe outcome, although likely contributed to um, some of the upper respiratory signs. Thanks. And another question for you regarding the 10 animals investigated for severe outcomes. Is there any breed information available? Was a certain breed identified more often? 
Breed was one of the criteria that was collected as part of the case investigation forms. So we do have that information, but there wasn't a clear trend to some breeds being over overrepresented. Thank you. Um, and back to our Salmonella prisoners. Um, do you have any thoughts on the best ways to reach and educate new poultry owners who are isolated and maybe not connected through uh, sources of information like 4-H or extension? Hi, this is Lauren. That's a great question. So one thing that we do try to routinely encourage is that um, people who sell back our poultry, so the hatcheries or the retail stores, actually provide what we would call um, point of sale education so that hopefully they submit or send home um, some of the flyers that we have available on our website that can be downloaded and printed. And then they actually send some of those home um, or have conversations and educate new buyers um, about uh, the risks of salmonella. And then one thing that we do try to do here is actually put some of our um, prevention messages out on social media in the hopes that those will get uh, shared and, and maybe reach some of those groups. Thank you. Um, and then we have another question on the Rickettsia presentation. Do vets send in blood work following a positive lab test on an in-house test for Rickettsia? Uh, hi, this is Dr. Carollo. I'm um, James's advisor. Um, so, um, yes, so for sending in a test to the DVDL, if you suspect vector borne disease, um, we would, you know, we can do the rickettsia um, PCR, which is general for all rickettsia, and then we can sequence and identify the species. Um, and then the IFA is really for rickettsia rickettsii, but cross reacts with other spotted fever group rickettsia. Um, I'm not sure the other part of the question was, are there in-house testing for rickettsia? Was that one of the questions? I believe it was just asking uh, based on in-house tests. Okay, oh, so if if the, the veterinarian suspects a rickettsia. Correct, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay, and back to Dr. Carpenter, we had a question, how many total samples were observed and or sent into state federal labs for testing? Sure, so each of these 10 cases was initially identified by PCR testing, which was a combination of nasal, oral, rectal, and conjunctival swabs. Um, and then this went on for confirmatory testing at USDA and BSL. And Necropsies or partial necropsies were performed for seven of the 10 animals, and a varying number of tissue blocks were collected from those for further evaluation. Thank you. Um, and then we had one other question for our poultry presenters. Uh, was there a correlation with any social demographics to the risk of salmonellosis? Hey everyone, this is Megan. Um, that is something that we are hoping to look at. One of the things we do note is that only a small proportion of our um, cases every year have um, the, the extra supplemental questionnaire administered to it to them. So we're hoping that what we can do is aggregate the data across years and hopefully look at that over time to see if there are any social um, demographic or exposure factors that might clue us in into um, ways that we can potentially prevent illness. So um, stay tuned, hopefully for a, a future Zohu call where we'll present that information. Great, thank you. And there was another question asking um, if we have sales patterns yet for 2021. Yeah, we have anecdotally heard from some of our colleagues in the industry that they have been setting eggs and preparing for sales similar to what was seen in 2020. So again, another increase in um, poultry sales at the feed stores. So that is something that we are um, expecting and continue to monitor for any human illness that might be related to that, as well as doing proactive outreach with the hatchery owners and the feed stores and um, other federal partners to get that information into the hands of poultry owners, um, hopefully before they get sick and to prevent any illness. Great, thank you. And then we have another question um, for Dr. Carpenter. 
do you have any comments on the predominant male gender for the severe veterinary SARS-CoV-2 cases? Um, I do not have any comments yet. We're continuing to learn more as we investigate more of these cases, but um, gender and predisposition is one of the factors that we're considering. Thank you. And then uh, one for Lexi, were any of the flocks uh, showing signs? Yeah, this is Megan. I'll jump in first and then I'll, I'll tag Lexi. So generally speaking, we don't see signs of salmonellosis in the birds. We don't hear that they're acting um, sick in any way and no clinical illness has been observed with, with most of these cases. Um, and Lexi, I'll turn it to you for the questions on the questionnaire. Yeah, thanks, Megan. So we do ask on the questionnaire, um, have you ever sought veterinary care for your live poultry? Yes, maybe, no, don't know. And then have you ever given antibiotics to your live poultry? Yes, maybe, no, and don't know. Um, however, we rarely get um, questionnaires back that say yes. Um, and if they do say yes, we often aren't able to follow up with the status of the bird or what sorts of antibiotics are given to the, to the poultry. Um, but we do ask about it on the questionnaire, but unfortunately don't receive a lot of data back. Thank you. And then there's a follow-up for Dr. Nichols um, from someone who did not see the entire presentation, but would like to know if you're coordinating with USDA APHIS um, and state ag agencies when working with backyard poultry owners. Absolutely. This is um, a great question from Dr. Klein. So every year we do uh, send out what we call our backyard poultry packet um, to our state um, ag officials. This typically goes through um, NASAHO, the National Association of State Health Officials, um, and through NASPHV partners, and it contains some resources, including links to some of the educational information on our website. And then we are in routine communication with our APHIS veterinary service colleagues, mostly those in NPIP, about any illnesses, ongoing outbreaks, or ways we can potentially prevent illnesses. Thank you. And we have time for maybe one more question. Um, this one on the Rickettsia presentation. This expansion of the range of invasive H. longicornis tick being tracked during the pandemic. Um, and is it anticipated that it could be an additional vector for this novel Rickettsial disease and Rocky Mountain spotted fever? Um, well, I cannot uh, talk to the uh, tracking of it. We're not currently tracking here at our lab, um, but I will say that it is possible um, that it can be a vector. Uh, we're early, in the early stages of tracking this disease right now and identifying a vector, um, so it is possible. Uh, we don't have any definitive information on that at this time. Thank you so much. So we, uh, if you have other questions for today's presenters, we have included their email addresses on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar and in today's email newsletter. Um, and then a reminder that a video of today's webinar will be posted within 30 days. Next slide, please. Thanks, everybody. And please join us for the next SOHU call on May 5th, 2021. We, as always, thank you for your participation. This ends today's webinar.